Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, you are joining a session on ranking authentication methods and choosing the right ones. Uh, definitely a hot topic, one that I have been asked about since being in my career in selling multi-factor authentication or any authentication. Um, so really looking forward to today's content and diving in. Uh, very quickly, we're gonna go into just some housekeeping. All of you are in listen-only mode. Uh, we do have a questions panel. You can enter questions at any point during the presentation, and then I'll do a live Q&A at the end. And of course, a recording will be shared following the webinar. So if you want to share it with any of your colleagues, friends, uh, you can't stay for the whole thing, no worries. We'll absolutely send out the recording as well so that you have it uh, for content to listen later on. Now, first, who am I? Uh, my name is Kimberly Biddings. I am the VP of product here at BioKey International. Um, as mentioned, I've been in cyber my whole career for well over a decade now um, and had quite the experience selling lots of authentication uh, to all types of industries, verticals, um, and people. And so really this is a subject that uh, is near and dear to me. I've talked about it at length with many of you as our valued customers listening in or some of you that I just don't know yet. Um, definitely looking forward to having the conversation following today as well to really talk about how do you select the right authentication method given that this impacts people and we'll, we'll go into that in more detail. Also as part of this presentation, the reason for the webinar is we just released an ebook on ranking authentication methods. It is attached as a handout to the GoToWebinar today so you can easily download it and you can also find it on the BioKey website. So what I'll go over today is definitely a high level view of what the ebook covers, but then every single authentication method is broken down by different factors and different ranking. One caveat I will put out there is these are the authentication methods that we specifically support or integrate into our platform and solutions. Um, and actually we just added another one, which is proximity cards. I'll weave that in as well. Um, and that will be added to the ebook also later on. So really looking forward to today, as I mentioned. Um, you know, when you think about multi-factor, it really goes without saying at this point that it is essential, right? Uh, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here because at this point, we're pretty aware cyber attacks are on the rise, right? We're hearing about that all the time, if not every single day, uh, every newscast I listen to, somebody's been breached or some attack is happening. We're hearing cyber insurance now requiring it, uh, either not, insuring an organization or threatening to increase premiums by 200, 300% at most sometimes. And then even in the government sector where it's being mandated, especially at the federal level uh, with the Biden executive order on zero trust. And so it's really become a, a basic practice and something that all organizations should have. And it's really one of the only things that I can point to at this point that has the reputation of a 90% prevention of attack or prevention of breach. So very critical to your infrastructure. Um, you know, if you're sitting out there and you have some MFA and you're wondering what to do next, this is a great presentation for you. If you have no multi-factor or even two-factor as this diagram shows, also a great presentation for you to really consider the challenges of MFA. And that's really what I wanna talk about today that it's one thing for someone to say, okay, you need to put in multi-factor authentication, right? You need to strengthen your security. But at the fundamental core of your business and your organization are you, people, right? Even by these, these images, everyone's different. Everyone has a different working environment, a different learning environment. And so one of the, the things that I get asked the most is that fundamental question, right, we've been talking about, which is balancing usability and security at its essence, which is how do you pick authentication methods that A, reduce your cyber risk, based on how sensitive the information is or how critical that application is. But then even more important, I would argue, is how do you get methods that actually work with your users and work in all their different scenarios? So for example, a remote HR manager authenticating is wildly different than your manufacturing floor worker or your law enforcement staff, right? So there's a, a big difference in how we all operate, how we all work, and that's really the secret to getting MFA that people will use and adopt. So that's what we'll talk through today. How do you pick those methods and looking at each method in greater detail? 
Now, first, to make sure you're all out there and listening, I'm going to launch a poll question. This is one of my favorite poll questions. Um, so how many authentication methods do you offer to your users? So this means when someone goes to log in, are they given one method to choose from, two methods, three methods, four methods, or maybe you just don't have any multi-factor at all? So I'm going to launch that poll real quick. Give you a few minutes, a uh, little Jeopardy music uh, to to start responding. So let's see. So far, lots of two method folks out there. Give you just a few more seconds to put in your answers. Good, we have a three. By the way, if you're only using two methods, you got two factor, right? I love that people say multi factor. True multi factor really includes three methods or more um, at one time. So uh, and from all the different categories. All right, we're going to close it in three, two, and one. Great. So looking at how many authentication methods do you offer your users? So no one's offering four or more. Uh, we have about 14% with three. Most of you are doing that two-factor, right, that 43%. Some of you won, and some of you, you are not having any uh, MFA yet. So glad you're here, here to join us. All right. So going into risks of picking the wrong methods, right? Why is it such a big deal? Why does it matter that you get the right mix of authentication for your users and your different types of users? And so these are really the high level things I would point out and they're, they're quite major to success in any implementation. First is your users are going to be very hesitant to adopt or use multi-factor. There's the issue of them just not being aware of why they have to use it, right? There's always that one or two users too that refuse to use it. Um, but also this is often caused when one method is tried to, trying to be applied across all users. It just doesn't work for them. So a great example that I see a lot is we're going to use an authenticator app, right? There are plenty out there, Google, Microsoft, um, they generate the code the person has to type in. Well, they require a smartphone. And so there's a lot of cases where users either can't use smartphones refuse to use smartphones, or as I'll cover later, will actually introduce costs to your business. So that one size fits all mentality is definitely something that will cause hesitation or frustration for users when you're trying to get them to adopt multi-factor. Now, the other thing I see is then there's security vulnerabilities, and that goes to the other side where either users aren't adopting it or we are hesitant to put in the right method based for security because it would inconvenience users and essentially what you've done is you have methods that don't reduce enough cyber risk based on the data that they're securing or how critical that application is to your business. So there's either a gap in usage that's creating the vulnerability, or like I said, it's a weak method compared to exactly how much risk there is should somebody actually gain unauthorized access. And then the third one is the unnecessary cost and, in, and operational inefficiencies. The most common scenario I see right now is, I don't know how to describe it, I guess bolted on or quilted together, however you want to think it, authentication methods. And so if this is you out there, you might, uh, you know, resonate with you as to this story. But, you know, we started with an authenticator app. It was free, it was easy to use, people like it. And then all of a sudden you find a group of users that can't use phones or won't use phones okay, then we'll start issuing them hardware tokens. And then you realize that there's users that can't use hardware tokens, can't use phones, and so now you're stuck maybe going back to an email OTP, or hopefully you could use a biometric. But what ends up happening is you have three, four, five, six different authentication methods, but they're all from different providers. And so the fundamental problem with that from a security perspective is now your policy control and how you configure and manage your policies which drive all of this security are now disjointed and potentially from different vendors and different organizations. And also we find that a lot of people are paying, just substantially paying more for one single method than they would for let's say a cohesive platform with all options included. So there's a lot of redundancy, um, operational inefficiencies that we're seeing and then just really unnecessary costs when the wrong method is being selected. So if anything else, we'll go through the methods. This is also a great slide to remember or take notes. 
Um, these are five steps to really implementing multi-factor that you should consider, right? If you're on the cusp of implementing it or you've only done a small rollout and wanna expand, these are five steps that I recommend to every customer that I talk to. So first and foremost, you have to assess your situation. You need to know where your risk is, but also how do your users work every day and who are those users, right? Get to know their workflows, get to know the impact that multi-factor would have. Working in healthcare IAM, I can tell you this was extremely critical because how example an ER doctor might operate versus a doctor who's doing 12 hour procedures are very wildly different. So again, it's very important to understand the situation that your users are in and also what's critical in terms of assets and, and data to your business in terms of risk. And then also what is your cyber insurer requiring? This has to be one of the most common reasons people are coming to us for authentication. And so it's really important to look at your renewal well before it happens. I've heard things like the renewal questions we had a year ago were 10 questions. I'm now getting three pages of requirements from my cyber insurer. So very important to understand your situation before you pick any methods. Then pick your methods, right? So again, giving your users enough choices. It's one thing to enforce that they have to use two methods or two factor to log in. It's another to give them five options of approved authentication methods to pick from those, let's say, if their phone isn't available that day or they just don't have access to email. It's very important because that keeps them moving forward and has no impact on productivity versus them being locked out and really having to call the help desk or be stopped in their tracks from being able to access what they need to do their job. Define your security policies. So like I said, before you're actually implementing these and rolling it out, please make sure that your security policies are specific to the group that the person's in. So if it's the marketing department, right? Um, OU, or even down to the individual. I'm sure a lot of you out there have the executive team or the executive, right? It's oftentimes the CEO that's the hardest one to get to use multi-factor, which is somewhat surprising to me. However, getting that individual his own policy and understanding what works for them is very, very important. And part of that policy is also configuring things like adaptive authentication or taking into consideration where they work, time and location, network, um, IP, right? So that you can give them a little bit of flexibility, let's say if they're always in their home office or if they're traveling. So again, security policy is another critical step. The other thing is communication. So multi-factor implementing it, right? We do this all day, we implement solutions. We can stand up multi-factor in a matter of days, if not weeks at most. The most challenging part is communicating that change to the people that have to use it every single day. So please build a communication strategy. I've done presentations, just did one last week, actually with some county government um, people at the CIO forum at NACO. And we talked all about actually becoming uh, experts in marketing. What you're doing is you're building out a communication campaign to understand and help people understand why they should care about doing it and why it's their responsibility to help keep your organization safe. And then finally, don't roll it out all at once to every single user. Highly, highly recommend to do a phased rollout. A lot of times people start with IT or privileged access users, which is a great place to start, and then roll that out step by step or department by department and keep track of how people are receiving it, what user satisfaction you're seeing, and any adjustments you may need to make along the way. So this is a great step to MFA. There's your five steps to just follow if you're, you're starting out or expanding your implementation. Okay, so as I mentioned, the ebook that we have, we just released um, and went through, we've taken each method and looked at them and ranked them based on the criteria that you see on the right. So security, convenience, or what we call ease of use, the total cost of ownership, effort to implement, ongoing maintenance, and then really important is phone-based or not, right? There's a lot of phone-based methods, but there's plenty of cases where you're gonna run into, we can't use phones for whatever reason, whether it's, again, cost prohibitive, people will not use it, um, or the work environment that the person is in is unsafe to use a phone-based method. One of the most common comparisons is what we started talking about as the challenge. What is the best method for usability versus security or ease of use versus security? 
as you can see here, there are some that really obvious off, off the bat, right? Security questions, we commonly know, right? This is being asked a series of questions. You provide the answers, so it is something that the user knows. And after answering those series of questions, they can complete the uh, authentication or password reset, whatever they may be trying to do. You can see from both a usability perspective, trying to remember those answers, I can never remember mine, um, or from a security perspective, because it's something that the user knows and often uses answers from social media that a hacker can go look up. Both usability and security, security questions are definitely some of the lowest. By the way, we didn't even include passwords on here. So if you think passwords are missing, it's not on purpose. We felt that that was something that is just bare bones. That's your Active Directory password. That's your baseline password to log in. This is talking about methods in addition to that. Now, some other ones that stand out to me here, for example, are push notifications, something that we support as well. Push notifications are super easy to use. I hear that over and over and over again, right? That we implemented, uh, let's say, Duo, for example, because it's super, super easy to use. That has been great and totally agree with that, but you are also sacrificing security because if you've looked at some of the recent FBI warnings or CISA warnings, they essentially say that what you're doing is device enrollment, and also now we're seeing things like MFA bombing, right, where the hacker keeps hammering the user to just answer the push notification with a yes. And so security on that method is lower. It means that when you have more sensitive data or higher risk data, that may not be the best method to pick for those users. It is a very good method for people external to your organization that may not be accessing sensitive information, or like I said, lower sensitivity access. So again, something that's very usable, but you do have to consider the security implications. I'll also highlight the web key and bio key mobile auth. This is the category we call identity bound biometrics. You'll hear me talk about that at length uh, towards the end as well. And this is essentially creating a unique centralized biometric identity that verifies the person completing the action. Web keys with fingerprint, mobile app is with a palm scan on the phone. And so it's very easy. It's actually passwordless in most cases. And then the security side, it's the only way to verify the person completing the action. So again, in those cases, you don't have to give up on usability for security and vice versa. So that's one of the first things in the ebook we break down, just because it's probably one of the most common things that people are trying to weigh. How much security do I need versus how much usability? Now, another way to think about authentication methods is what's your priority? What are, you, what are you trying to achieve? Or what's the use case that somebody is in? So we'll look at some of these uh, at a high level. First and foremost, highest security. Again, there are other methods that offer uh, high security. One of them I'll highlight that's not listed there as a recommended method is your FIDO2 WebAuthN tokens, right? Or what you think of as hardware tokens. These are higher security, right? They contain a, a PKI certificate on there. They're definitely something that's secure, something that you have. The only thing there is that they can be handed over or shared. So there's been plenty of use cases and examples where that hardware token is left in the device for all users to use or is taped to the middle of a room for anybody that wants to pull it off the wall, plug it into their machine and authenticate. So we really believe the, the most highest level of security is really those methods, the identity bound biometric, when you can verify the person completing the action who's actually been enrolled and their biometrics been enrolled. So that's something that, that's really high in terms of security and getting the trust back that you're actually trusting a person doing the action versus just a token, password, or device. Now, easy to implement. Authenticator app and mobile auth. Both are mobile apps. Super easy to install. The user installs them on their phone. It's usually a very quick enrollment or QR code enrollment. Both of those support that. And then the user's off to the races. So in terms of implementation, overhead for your IT department, those are probably the simplest ones. Very, very straightforward to use and very easy for the user to do a one-time self-enrollment as well. Now, the other one I get asked, as I mentioned, is oftentimes a smartphone. So standard traditional authentication, most of it has become phone-based, right? So it's either an app on a phone like we just talked about, or it's the push token to the phone, um, touch ID, right, device-based biometrics. 
the challenge is that there's a, a large percentage of your customers and your employees that will not have a smartphone or cannot use a smartphone. There's also the group that refuse to use it. <laughs> so one example I'll give, uh, we work with a lot of higher education institutions. There are great populations of their users that are in buildings that have no cell phone reception whatsoever. So right then and there, there are some methods like text message, one-time passcodes, things like that that just will not be able to be used. The other thing we're starting to see in about 10 states in the United States is that there's actually phone stipends required that if you're requiring the employee to use a smartphone for authentication, that you have to pay a portion of their phone plan. So that's something that you can still use a smartphone, but I think it's, it's costs that you need to prepare for or understand that will be used. If you're talking about the rest of the world globally, using smartphones for, for business reasons is actually very much a blocker to, in a lot of cases um, due to just rights, GDPR, a lot of additional regulations that are preventing smartphones from being able to be relied on outside of even the United States as well. So for that, we recommend WebKey, which is our fingerprint scanning, simple fingerprint scanner, low cost at any desktop, any device. It's passwordless, you scan a finger and you're logged in. Also the hardware tokens are an option. I've heard that if you're not willing to use your smartphone, fine, we'll give you a token. Um, so we've, we've seen that as an alternative. And then lower security, obviously usability, security questions can be used. Again, I'd caution on that one just because it's only using something that the user knows and does pose some amount of risk. Secure third party and also remote access, I'll talk about together. These are situations where you don't want to necessarily ship somebody a hardware token or hand them an extra device. So a lot of those mobile-based authentication methods are great choices. So authenticator apps, mobile auth, push tokens, and then for secure remote access, those IBB methods, the identity bound biometrics, really allow you to prove the person is who they say they are and verify the person completing the action. That capacity is very important in third party supplier, but also in anybody that's remote that you're not actually visibly seeing or isn't on necessarily your corporate network um, and is accessing remotely, which thanks to COVID is a lot of us today. Um, and then finally, the shared workstation. So this is a great example where most of the methods just won't work. Um, shared workstation, right? A lot of times you see them in manufacturing, retail, uh, bank branches, even fitness centers we've seen them in. Um, and so what happens there is a lot of times you're having essentially multiple users access the same workstation. One of the big security no-nos, but I see it as a uh, workaround, is people put generic Active Directory accounts on that shared workstation. However, you now don't know who's logging into that device. So simple solution here, again, the fingerprint scanner, put it onto all of the desktop, and then all it is is a quick fingerprint scan, no password, and you can actually audit trail and know exactly who's logging into that shared workstation at any given time. We had Orange Bank and Trust do that. They did it across 2,000 desktops in 45 days. And now everybody's allowed to authenticate across 11 locations at any device with the same fingerprint experience that they have regardless of where they are. So the shared workstation, again, unique requirement. So again, this is looking at your environment, trying to figure out what method fits where, right? Based on risk or based on for example, these priorities that you're looking for. Now, one of the questions you might be asking is, what about the cost? Um, this is also a obviously critical component, right? It would be great if you could say, well, we'll just buy it all, we'll implement it all, we'll have it all in place. But obviously, a lot of you are out there working with a lot of limited budgets um, or are cost conscious at this point. One of my favorite parts uh, about cyber insurers requiring this in 30 days or less, because often what they're asking for and asking you to put in costs more than you may have in your budget. So the cost is absolutely important. When we're looking at this, this is total cost of ownership. So lowest is in terms of lowest total cost of ownership, uh, while not sacrificing any security, First and foremost would be the identity bound biometrics, mainly the fingerprint. Those readers cost $40 at most. 
Um, some of the higher regulated ones or FITS compliant, if you wanted those, could get up to $90 or so. But it's a one-time spend. They stay with the device, have a long, long uh, life to them in terms of any power requirements or anything. Um, and so a very good option, as well as the Authenticator app. You know, all too often I hear that this is free. We know it's not 100% free, but often it's included as part of, let's say, your Microsoft subscription or your Microsoft instance. And with Google Authenticator, they actually do offer that holistically for free to most organizations. So again, there's some low cost opportunities and options for you. On the other side of it, the highest cost that we see is actually with those FIDO2 WebAuthn tokens or the hardware tokens. And so while the individual token doesn't cost a lot, each token is, you know, some people get them for $25, I've seen up to $100, depending on the model you get. Um, some bulk pricing, you can get a little bit lower. But what happens is, it's actually the overhead. So first of all, you have to buy multiple tokens for each user, more often than not, because they need a backup, or they have two locations they work in, or they need to make sure if they lost one, they're not completely sitting there without being able to authenticate. The other cost comes in of managing the tokens, keeping the inventory, distributing tokens to people who have lost them, reissuing tokens if people need additional ones. So it's actually that overhead cost on your IT team that not only is, is a monetary cost, but it's also an opportunity cost in terms of they're spending their time managing these tokens instead of necessarily prioritizing other key projects. And if you're like most folks out there who have limited IT resources, this can really be a drain on the IT team in terms of being able to support that authentication method. So again, something to consider when you're looking at methods, how much do these cost, not only in the upfront purchase, but then total cost of ownership for how much does it cost to maintain and, and the overhead in terms of ongoing usage of that authentication method. Now, I mentioned I dive in a little bit into identity bound biometrics. The ebook goes into every single method by those categories, and I'll show you an example of that in just a moment. Um, I wanted to highlight identity bound biometrics, not as the only answer, as you saw. There's a mix of methods you should always be using, but it is something to really make that trifecta of multi factor. So, something that you know, something that you have, and this is really something that you are that can complete that multi factor strategy so that you can actually support things that are higher risk. You don't want credentials that are handed over, shared, forgotten, stolen. Um, you control the enrollment. And also it's really good method, as I mentioned, for those shared workstations or where phones and hardware tokens are completely not reliable, not safe, or just won't work for those use cases. So identity bound biometrics, like I said, centralized, unique biometric identity. It's centrally stored biometrics, if you're familiar with those. Non-reversible hash biometric data, so there's no gaining access to the server. Um, and then on top of that, it's all strict session management. And the capture of that fingerprint or the palm scan using mobile auth um, is all done with liveness detection as well to really prevent any imposters or pictures being used as some of those biometrics. So it's definitely a great option and consideration for you if you're looking to add to your authentication methods. And as I mentioned, the ebook takes every single one of the methods we've talked about today and breaks it down by security, convenience, cost, implementation, maintenance, and whether it's phone-based or not. And there's a description for every one of these categories under each. So for uh, security, for WebKey, it'll talk about why it has very high security versus mobile auth, it'll talk about why it has high convenience versus very high convenience. And it does that for all of them, the FIDO2, the security questions, the OTPs, all of those are broken down in the ebook by detail so that you can really evaluate which methods work where. Again, not a one size fits all approach. All right, so. That is the overview today. Uh, very high level, like I said, we wanted to breeze through what the ebook contains, give you a taste so that you can start evaluating which methods would work where. You can download that ebook, it's a handout on the webinar today. And also we highly encourage you, if you're not sure, as you can tell, we talk about this all day. <laughs> Please ask us, right? Contact us, contact me directly. You can find me on LinkedIn. 
Um, but let us know, right? These strategy calls are very important to know exactly which authentication methods you should be putting and where. All right, so I'm gonna open it up to just a few uh, questions and I'll give just a minute for a couple more to come in. All right, so one question I had was about proximity cards. So I did mention them in the beginning. The question is, is it the same card for physical access as for online or applications? So um, yes, oftentimes you will have physical security cards um, that are being used to essentially badge tap into let's say a room or a building. Um, we do support those also for authentication. Again, if that's what your people are already carrying around, that's part of their use case, then it's really important for them to maybe use that for authentication because it just keeps that experience consistent. So we do support them. We support uh, some of the most popular cards and readers. Um, and so that's something that can be included into your authentication profile at any time. Another question I have is, are these all purchased separately? So no. Um, so when we look at a solution, you can either have some of these already. So let's say you already had uh, Microsoft Authenticator and Duo Push Token. Those can easily be integrated into our single platform with a security policy. And then you get the added benefit of the identity bound biometrics. We sell our own hardware tokens. So you can start consolidating, or I say aggregating, the solutions or the various solutions that you have. Um, so it really depends on your preference, but it's not a rip and replace to necessarily get all of this consolidated under one multi-factor strategy. <laughs> so I like this question, what's the worst uh, deployment you've seen? Oh gosh. Um, so the worst one I think I've seen is locking out the ER nurses from their day to day. That that probably took the cake. Um, there was a consultant that was working on the solution. They implemented the same thing across the entire hospital and ER nurses came in to start their shifts or change shifts. And as they started to roll in, they were unable to authenticate. So that was definitely a direct impact to business, but also direct impact to patient care which obviously is a very serious concern. Great example why you should roll it out in pilots. Um, and then the next one, is how many people actually do multi-factor versus two-factor, two FA, I assume, you know, everybody, two FA means two-factor. Yeah, so very few. Um, there's not many use cases I've seen where people are achieving true multi-factor authentication. Uh, at this point in time, most common, we should we should really be calling two-factor authentication. Um, and that, you know, is essentially a lot of these are password plus something. Um, password plus, let's say, uh, fingerprint, touch ID, um, something like that. And that's just kind of nature of, I think, you know, rolling these things through three-factor, you know, password plus fingerprint plus hardware token. Uh, I've seen that in definitely highly regulated, very highly sensitive um, environments, but few and far between. Most is, is truly underneath the covers 2FA. Um, great question here. Can Windows Hello be used as a secure authentication method? So yeah, um, so Windows Hello is one of those device native biometrics, right? Again, if you are accessing the same laptop you're at home, you're always on your machine, it's not a shared situation, um, you're not accessing extremely sensitive data, Windows Hello is perfectly fine to unlock the desktop. One thing I would encourage you to think about is that in any point, it requires stronger authentication to combine that with potentially um, a different factor or including an actual external fingerprint scanner to verify that person centrally. And then the other thing that's important in, in authentication that I, I failed to mention, and I apologize, is step up authentication. So remember, when you log into a desktop, that's one point of authentication. When you then go to log into the HR system, that's another authentication that, yes, can be single sign-on, right? Could not require any additional authentication. Or because it's a sensitive app, you can do step up to say, hey, Windows Hello was good for the desktop, 
but because you're accessing very sensitive information, I now need you to give me additional factors, whether that's uh, identity bound biometrics, a hardware token, something with additional um, security in terms of the sensitivity of the data. But great question. Yeah, Windows 11 is built in. It's, it's a smooth um, experience for a lot of folks. And again, depends on that situation. All right, so that looks like all the questions that are coming in for today. Um, I really appreciate everyone's time joining me. Uh, as you can tell, let me know. I'll talk about multi-factor, or I should say authentication all day. Please make sure you get the ebook. It is a handout. There'll also be a quick poll or survey, excuse me, following the close of the webinar. So please provide your feedback. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, from around the world today, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.